main thrust of today's message is that our human nature opposes God and tries to find substitutes to fill his place. But these substitutes are faulty, they're pathetic, they're useless when it comes to comparing them to God. They cannot fulfill us, they cannot sustain us, they can only ruin us. But we're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13 today. It's going to be our primary verse. If you want to stand and read that today with me, you might have to read from your good old-fashioned scripture instead of on the screen. Verse 13, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Father, I do thank you for this time together today. Thank you for your word. God, I pray that you would help us to revere your name. Help us to understand your word clearly. God, speak through me this morning as your vessel, your mouthpiece today, God. Not about what I think is important, not about my words or my opinions, but God, help us to honor you and to hear what you have to say, and more importantly, not just be hearers, but doers of what you say. In Jesus' name, amen. I thought I did, but apparently I didn't. (laughs) Jeremiah was a prophet, kind of a last chance prophet for the nation of Judah. Their their sister nation Israel had departed and ran from the Lord so far they were banished and exiled and taken over by the Assyrians. Now, Judah, their sister nation, was not too far behind. God sent Jeremiah to be like a last chance prophet to warn the nation to repent, otherwise destruction was coming. And in this passage, we see what the people were actually doing when it came to their relationship with their God and King. Jeremiah's message was to God's people who have rebelled against him and were following after other gods, listening to false prophets, and were content in their sin. Essentially, they fell away from the Lord. And in following away, following, falling, not following, falling away from the Lord, they committed two sins. If you look at verse 13, it gives two sins they primarily committed against the Lord. Number one, they forsook the Lord. Number one on your outline, they forsook the Lord. Forsaken means to abandon the Lord. They abandoned God, their Savior, their Lord, the one who brought them out of Egypt, the one who had constructed them, the one who had established them as a nation, who provided for them time and time again. Yet what did they do? They forsook him. They abandoned him. The Lord describes himself in this passage as a spring of living water. He says, you have forsaken me, the spring of living water. But how did they abandon the Lord? How did they forsake the Lord? I'll give you a couple of things. Reaching back to verse 5 and 6 of that same chapter, look at this. This is what the Lord says. What fault did your ancestors find in me, that they strayed so far from me? They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. They did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, through a land of deserts and ravines, a land of drought and utter darkness, a land where where no one travels and no one lives. Did you see number one here is that their ancestors forgot the past, and they failed to teach the new generations. Their ancestors forgot the past and failed to teach the new generations. They lost their love for the one who rescued them out of Egypt. They were not teaching. Their ancestors did not remember themselves, nor did they teach what God had done for the nation, what God had did had did what God did for the people. You have to forgive my English sometimes, all right? They forgot. And because they forgot, they didn't teach the new generations, then what do you expect the new generations to do? Follow their leaders. Follow the ones who came before them. And so it continued to regress morally, continued to regress theologically, and they forgot history, his story, 
They did not inquire of the Lord to make their decisions. They didn't concern themselves with God's affairs. They, didn't, they did not care about the Lord. The one who created them, established them, rescued them from slavery. Do you see any resemblance of that in America today? People forgetting what God has done. Ultimately, the greatest thing God has done was the cross. The cross of Christ. Well, that's very little talked about and spoken about in our country today. We were founded upon Christian principles, I remind you, right? And what have we done? We've forgotten those. We've forgotten God. We've forgotten Christ. And we're wandering away as a nation. But we shouldn't be pointing blame at everybody else and it's their problem. We should be pointing fingers back at ourselves because we have a role here. The church has a role here. If the church has done its job across the nations and across the centuries, we wouldn't be in the predicament we're in now. You see that? So we need to take some blame. We need to take some fault of our own and saying, well, we didn't do what we were supposed to do. If we were really fulfilling what God's role for the church is, go and make disciples of all nations, we wouldn't be in this problem. We would have defeated this long ago and continue to defeat it. Why? Because we remember what God has done. We shared what God was done. And we continue to follow after God and concern ourselves with the Lord. And we would elect officials that would do the same. Amen. Now, America is not God's chosen nation. I hope you understand that. That's Israel. Still Israel. Okay? America is not God's chosen nation. However, God has blessed this nation. Matter of fact, he says that he would bless every nation who would follow after him in repentance. But I wonder how much more patience is he going to have with us? Time will tell. My prayer is that the church would wake up and start doing its job. And that God would move in people's hearts. That they would be changed. But it starts with each one individual. It starts with us. We can have an impact. A small as we think that we are here, God used 12 men to change the world. How much more could he use a church even this size to change the world? Are you willing to do whatever the Lord has asked of you? Are you willing to go wherever he is, wherever he is asking you to go, to say whatever he is asking you to say, to go to the nations, to go to your neighbor, to go to your family, to reach the world with the gospel message? We've got to stand up on Christian principles. Amen? America will be without hope if we, as the Christian church, if we forget the past, and if we don't surround ourselves with God's word and consume ourselves with the Lord, then we will be the downfall of America and of the church as it exists today. We have to stand up and take charge. Number two, not only did their ancestors forget the past, but their priests, their priests did not seek the Lord in upholding the law. The priests in that culture were very much like their leaders, their elected leaders, so to speak. But in verse 8 of that same chapter 2, it says, The priests did not ask, Where is the Lord? Those who deal with the law did not know me. Their leaders rebelled against me. The leaders, the priests, were not following after the Lord. We're definitely seeing that in America. Our leaders are not prone to follow after God. But we live in a very unique nation where we can elect our officials to a large degree. And we need to make sure that we are electing officials that agree with the Lord, that agree with God, that agree with Scripture. Of course, sadly, those are few and far between. But we do our best under our best conviction to present elected officials that are going to be consistent with the Lord. Their leaders abandoned the Lord. And what was evil they called good, and what was good they called evil. They started to warp what was good and what was evil, and so the society followed. If the, if the head is corrupted... Well, then so will the nation be. 
Number three, the prophets prophesied by false gods. The prophets prophesied by false gods. In verse 8, again, the prophets prophesied by Baal, Baal following worthless idols. The prophets of the Old Testament are very similar to what would be the pastors and preachers of today. Evangelists of today. They were to go around and, and present the message of God's word. However, in Jeremiah's day, there were false prophets who were prophesying by other false gods. And people were following them. They're saying, I got a word for, for the, from the Lord for you. And they would prophesy this warped view of reality. And people would follow them. Are we seeing that today? Absolutely. We're seeing it all over the place. Preachers not preaching the true word of God. They're corrupting God's word to preach their own agenda or preach their own opinion and to do what, or say what they want to say or to say something that is popular instead of the truth. Listen, if you're hearing a preacher, and he might be a good vocalist, he may be a good um, orator, he may be able to talk really well, but if he does not mention sin, that's a problem. Sin is not a very comfortable message to preach. But I'll tell you, it is one of the fundamental doctrines of Scripture. The reason of Christ, of why He came, was sin. If sin is not preached, Christ would have no reason to come if there is no sin. He would have no reason to die for us. Don't listen to the preachers who are not talking about sin. They may talk about all the good things and, you know, they may talk about Christ and what he's done for us. I feel like I got a choo choo. <laughs> may talk about Christ and what he's done for us. But if they don't mention sin, they're missing it. Sometimes we got to present the bad news so that the good news looks even better. Right? If there is no bad news, there is no good news. <laughs> Bad news is, we're all destined for hell because we're all sinners. The Bible says none of us are good, not even one. We all have sin in our lives. And because of that, Christ came to die for sinners like you and me. That's the good news. We cannot earn our way to heaven. We cannot do enough good works. You see that and you hear that a lot in our culture. That if you, if you just be a good person, you be basically good. Or if your good outweighs your bad, maybe you'll go to heaven. That's a common flaw in a lot of popular preachers today. Or this whole name it, claim it theology. I won't even get into that. Don't have time. Or if you do enough good works, then God will reward you with good things. Maybe the reason you're experiencing all this hurt and sorrow and stuff in your life is because you just ain't living right enough. That's a popular warped view of Scripture. The idea that if you live right and if you do good things, God is obligated to bless you. He is obligated to give you good things here on earth. You have a right to get your private jet or to get your Ferrari or to drive around in your Mercedes or whatever it is because you've done good things. Such a warped view of how God works. Jesus, the most righteous man on this world, he was poor. You realize that, right? Paul, beaten, crushed, bruised, shipwrecked, almost died several times. Obviously, he was living right. But when you're living right, truly right, and obeying this word, this world hates you. Matter of fact, that's the promise Jesus said. It says, if this world hates you, remember, it hated me first. When we follow after the Lord, this world is going to hate us. It will find something wrong with you. But we should continue to love them and share the gospel. First Timothy, or sorry, Second Timothy, chapter four, verse three and four. Paul commented on everything I just talked about. He said, "For a time will come." Listen to this. Just see how relevant this scripture is today. For a time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers 
to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. In other words, what Paul was saying is that people are not going to put up with the truth. And to satisfy their own desires, they're going to surround themselves with teachers to tell them what they want to hear instead of what they need to hear. We are seeing that all over in so many different churches around our globe today. When people are not hearing the truth, they push the truth aside because they don't want to hear it. They just want to be caressed and rubbed and lulled to sleep <laughs> rather than shaken awake. Stop listening to these lies and consume yourself with the truth. Number two, not only did they forsake the Lord, they dug their own cisterns. They dug their own cisterns, number two. What is a cistern? Well, it's basically like a giant hole in the ground. And it was usually of some type of rock, and then they would pitch it with clay to create a bowl of some sort, a reservoir for rainwater, particularly. And they would hold this rainwater in the rainy season, and then when it became the dry season, they would still have water to drink from and water their, their plants and so on and so forth. That was a cistern back there. It's kind of like a pool with a concrete liner in it. It would collect rainwater. But they would need these cisterns in particularly dry climates because they would not have water otherwise. But I want you to notice what the Lord was doing here. He was contrasting the cistern and the spring. You see that? He was contrasting the cistern and the spring. The cistern contrasted the spring. What does that mean? The cistern held leftover water. The spring brought fresh water. And God was saying, you have forsaken me, the fresh water, and were satisfied with the, with the rotten, wasted, stale water. Not only that, this cistern that you trusted in so much was broken. It had cracks in it. The cistern was cracked. Look at that last, that last piece there of verse 13. The cis broken cisterns that cannot hold water. That's what the people were trusting in. The cistern was useless when it was cracked. It would leak water and would not hold the rain water in season. And it would dry up. Not only dry up, it would be filled with mud. And to make this atrocity even more outrageous, later on in Jeremiah's life, and we'll get to that eventually, he was arrested by the king, and he was thrown into a muddy, broken cistern as a prison cell. They took this broken cistern and made it a grave for the prophet of God. This would have been an extreme slap in the face to the Lord. And we made, we trade springs of living water. We trade the Lord for broken cisterns today. Obviously, God was not literally meaning that Israel's most grievous sin was trading spring water for cistern, broken, muddy water. There was a spiritual connection he was trying to convey here. The main point of the imagery was that Israel had abandoned God, who was the spring of living water, and they substituted God for this poor, pitiful, unfilling, unfulfilling substitute that could not even hold water. You know, in the food industry, many people are offering healthy versions or healthy substitutes. Y'all ever seen these things? that uh, health, particularly health and fitness enthusiasts, they'll promote, you know, instead of eating this, you should eat this. It's a healthy substitute. Now we'll agree there are some healthy substitutes, but then there are some pretty poor ones. All right? I'm going to give you a few of those just for an example. Y'all know that they have nut cheeses? Yeah, it's a real thing. It's a cheese not made from dairy like an animal. It's made from nuts. I'm just going to say this as a fitness professional and as a man of opinion. 
just stay away from that. Okay? <laughs> it ain't good. Okay? It is a poor substitute for cheese. Okay? Y'all about margarine? Y'all went, remember the big margarine kick back years ago where everybody was trying to replace butter with margarine? Go, go margarine, it's better for you, better for you. Well, it turns out it ain't. Who knew? It's not as good for you as butter. Butter actually has good qualities for you. Why? Because it's made naturally, right? Margarine is processed. Somehow when man puts, tries to put their stamp on what God has made, they mess it up. Who knew? We like to mess things up. How about Slim Fit? Y'all remember Slim Fit? Anybody remember Slim Fit? Like two people. Now basically, it was a, a shake. That's what I meant. <laughs> Slim Fit. That's a new one. It's coming out in a couple weeks. Slim Fast. Um, it was a, basically a shake uh, that... All they promoted was, this is all you need to sustain your life and to get healthy. It was just drink this shake, right? Drink this shake. And I've tasted a few of them. They weren't bad. But that's not going to fulfill you, right? It is not intended to fulfill you. They may try to persuade you that it's going to fulfill you and this is all you need. You drink about 18 of these a day and you'll be fine, right? You've got to remember, these are food companies trying to make money, all right? They want your money. So they try to convince you that this is what you need, right? Well, that's just like Satan does that to us today. This is what you need, Adam and Eve. Don't you want to be like God, Satan said to them? Don't you think God's holding out on you? You need that fruit if you want to be like him. This is what you need. You don't need that butter. You need to eat this margarine. It's good for you. I don't think Satan had good English either. But there are no good substitutes for a good, healthy, balanced diet. And there is no good substitutes for the Lord. There is no good substitute for faithful obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other way into heaven except through the cross of Christ and faith in Him. There is no other way to have a contented life on earth except through obedience to the Lord. But we think, some reason, somehow or another, we think we can find a better way. We may not willingly admit this, but it is definitely seen in our day-to-day -day walk. It is definitely seen in how we live our life and how the choices that we make. We follow after other things instead of concerning ourselves with the Lord's affairs. We search after things to try to fulfill us. Power, money, influence, yet they still leave us empty. We seek out other things and relationships and even sex, and they, we feel foolish and still ever longing. We try to find purpose in art and sports and music and any other career, yet we find ourselves still lacking. There's still a void that we have to fulfill. That nothing seems to touch it. Some people try to pursue alcohol and drugs and medication to numb the pain of suffering and loneliness instead of repenting and clinging to the Lord. These are all broken cisterns that do not satisfy. There is only one spring of life, spring of living water. And his name is Jesus. Amen. But there's a big picture here I want you to see. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had a perfect and innocent life. They had a relationship with God. They walked with God in the garden with him. However, they traded this utopia for an attempt to have a little more. They were deceived, and they were not content with worshiping God and submitting to God. They wanted to be God. They didn't want to submit themselves to the author of life. They wanted to be more like God. They were deceived and led to believe that God was holding out on them. They wanted more. They wanted 
God. They tried to determine their own purpose in life instead of submitting to God who gave them their life and their purpose. You see that? I'm going to read that one again. They tried to determine their own purpose in life instead of submitting to God who gave them life and their purpose. But it wasn't just Adam and Eve. All of humanity has fallen and fallen down the same path. The sin of Adam and Eve has unleashed death and disease and sorrow and pain and heartache. And it would, it would not have mattered which two humans were there in the garden. We blame Adam and Eve, but we should blame ourselves. I've used this argument time and time again. If God knows everything, and if he knew that you would make a different choice than Adam and Eve, then why didn't God put you there? Fact is, we all have to admit we would have done the same. As a matter of fact, we do the same every day because we all sin. Has anyone without sin? Y'all better not raise your hands now. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We traded the spring of life, the Lord above all lords, the King of kings, our author of life, who loves us and created us for a relationship. We abandoned him to pursue this world and this life of sin. Do you see the big picture here? The good news is, there is still hope. Jesus said to the woman at the well in John 14, or John 4, verses 13 and 14. Jesus answered the woman, Everyone who drinks this living, this water, will be thirsty again. He's talking about the water of the well. Anyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus is the well of life. He is the spring of life. And in order for us to truly experience this spring again, we must do so by faith and obedience. There is no other way around it. You, can't, you can drink of this spring and find comfort, peace, and purpose. But that first comes by recognizing our sin realizing that true satisfaction and salvation is found through Jesus and repenting of our sin by confessing him as Lord of our life. Have you received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior today? That's where it starts. That is where it starts. But even if you have, there may be things in your life that you're running to that is just a broken cistern that it cannot hold water. Are you willing to admit it? And saying, Lord, I, I've been running to this dried up hole in the ground for too long. And I'm sorry, Lord. Forgive me. And you know what happens? For those who confess their sins, he is willing and able and just to forgive us. And that is a beautiful picture. He is a forgiving God because he loves you and you and you and you. And he wants us to come to him. If I can help you in any kind of way this morning, do not leave here without dealing with the Lord and how he's dealing with you. We're going to give you that opportunity right now. If you know you need to be saved, you can come and talk to me during the invitation or after church. If you know you need to be baptized, you can come to me and we'll discuss it and see um, if that's your best next step. Maybe you need to come for a church membership. I don't know how the Lord's dealing with you. But you know, and God can probe your heart if you'll just listen and obey. Let's pray together. You stand as we pray. Father, thank you so much for your love and justice. Thank you for ultimately the cross that you gave to us as the picture 
and as our salvation. The picture of love and beauty, but also that was the only way to rescue us from our sins. Father, help us to revere your name and not to run after all of these other things in life that this world has to offer that will never satisfy us, God. Help us to pursue you above all else. We thank you for grace. We thank you for your love. You convict people here within the sound of my voice. And I pray that they would humble themselves before you and to repent of sins. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.